In the United States Civil Code, Section 1312 of Title 43, the Public Lands Title, under Seaward Boundaries of States, it mentions a distinction between the Union and the United States. Quote, the seaward boundary of each original coastal state, uppercase S, is approved and confirmed as a line three geographical miles distant from its coastline, or in the case of the Great Lakes, to the international boundary. Any state admitted subsequent to the formation of the Union, which has not already done so, may extend its seaward boundaries to a line three geographical miles distant from its coastline or to the international boundaries of the United States in the Great Lakes or any other body of water traversed by such boundaries. Now there it makes a distinction between the Union, uppercase U, and the United States, uppercase U and uppercase S. Now, many of us might say that the Union and the United States are in fact the same thing. And in the way that this is worded, you could assume such. But as we will look further into this video, they're not. The Union is a separate entity from the United States. And the states that were admitted to the Union were not the states, well, I suppose some of them could be, but either way, there were the United States being admitted to the Union. So various states within the United States admitted themselves or were admitted into the Union separate from the United States. Here the United States simply operates as a term to talk about a land mass and not any sort of entity that really exists nowadays because all things are governed underneath the Union. And we'll see further about how this happens. Uh, for the rest of this, it states any claim hereto, for, or hereafter asserted either by constitutional provision, that's a lowercase c, statute, or otherwise indicating the intent of a state, uppercase s, so to extend its boundaries is approved and confirmed without prejudice to its claim, if any it has, that its boundaries extend beyond that land, line. Nothing in this section is to be construed as questioning or in any manner prejudicing the existence of any states, uppercase S, seaward boundary beyond three geographical miles if it was so approved by its constitution, lowercase c, or laws prior to or at the time such state, uppercase S, became a member of the Union, uppercase U, or if it has been heretofore approved by Congress, uppercase C. They do not make things uppercase and lowercase by accident. Generally speaking, the uppercase references a specific entity and the lowercase does not. That's how titles work. Now a reference to this great union can be found in the great union of the popular masses. And some will be familiar with what this work is and its implications. So let's read into it. The decadence of the state, the sufferings of humanity, and the darkness of society have all reached an extreme. To be sure, among the methods of improvement and reform, education, industrialization, strenuous efforts, creation, destruction of that which is bad and outmoded, and construction are all right, but there is a method more fundamental than these, which is that of the great union of the popular masses. Now here, the great union of the popular masses is not uppercase. But at the same time, this is a translation. If we study history, we find that all the movements that have occurred in the course of history, or whatever type may be, have all without exception resulted from the union of a certain number of people. A greater movement naturally requires a greater union, and the greatest movement requires the greatest union. All such unions are more likely to appear in a time of reform and resistance, that which decides between de victory and defeat is the solidity, or shall we say solidarity, or weakness of the Union and whether the ideology that serves as its basis is new or old, true or false. This is in brackets, I imagine this is probably edited in. 
The aristocrats and capitalists and other powerful people in society have carried their oppression to an extreme, dot, 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 dot. And consequently, the decadence of the state, the sufferings of humanity, and the darkness of society have also reached an extreme. It is then that reform and resistance arise, and that the great union of the popular masses is achieved. When the great union of the popular masses of France opposed the great union of the adherents of the monarchy and the victory of political reform had been attained, many countries followed the French example and undertook all sorts of political reforms. After last year's struggle in Russia, which pitted the great union of the popular masses against the great union of the aristocracy, and the great union of the capitalists then led to the victory of social reform, Many countries, Hungary, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Germany, have followed Russia's example and have undertaken all sorts of social reforms. Although the victory is not complete, it may certainly become so, and one can also imagine that it will spread throughout the whole world. Why is the great union of the popular masses so terribly effective? Because the popular masses in any country are much more numerous than the aristocracy, the capitalists, and the holders of power in society. We should know that our brothers of other lands have often employed this method in pursuing their interests. We must arise and imitate them. We must carry out our great union. As soon as we arise and let out a shout, the traitors will get up and tremble and flee for their lives. If we wish to achieve a great union in order to resist the powerful people whom we face, who harm their fellow men, and in order to pursue our own interests, we must necessarily have many small unions to serve as its foundation. And there you get an explanation of what the, how the great union is comprised of many small unions. Because our circumstances and professions are different, there are also certain differences, large or small, in the sphere of our common interests. Hence the method union, and as a note here, it is stipulating that union is a method for seeking our common interests also display certain differences, large or small. We are peasants, and so we want to unite with others who cultivate the land like we do in order to pursue our various interests. And that part sounds a lot like mockery and diminishing uh, what is a quote-unquote peasant. Anyway, the interests of us who cultivate the land can only be protected by ourselves. Oh, hence, of course, the people who cultivate the land are peasants. Subjects, essentially. How do the landlords treat us? Are the rents and taxes heavy or light? Are our houses satisfactory or not? Are our bellies full or not? Is there enough land? Are there those in the village who have no land to cultivate? We must constantly seek answers to all these questions. Sounds like the same sort of bureaucratic, non-committal type of thing. We are workers. We wish to unite with others who work like ourselves in order to pursue the various interests of us workers. We cannot fail to seek a solution to such questions concerning us workers as the level of our wages, the length of the working day, and the equal or unequal sharing of dividends. Now, naturally, this is the same type of verbiage that you'll find with politicians pretending to be one of the, quote, little people. In continuation, we are students, we are already living in the 20th century, and yet they still compel us to observe the old ceremonies and old methods. Here they're trying to get rid of a tradition because that's very harmful to their narrative that continuously evolves with whatever they need it to. Anyway, the country is about to perish, and yet they still paste up posters forbidding us to love our country. We want our own union. We are women. We are sunk even deeper in a sea of bitterness. We want to carry out our union. Transcript by the Maoist Documentation Project, HTML revised 2004 by Marxists.org. So there, that is your communist flavor of socialism, which is pretty much the same thing, but it all bases itself in this great union. So our story here starts in the 1860s of the United States when the so-called Civil War took place, which was more of a war to establish quote-unquote civil authority. Here we have this interesting entity called the Union, 
newspaper. The, this is according to Wikipedia, which, as we all know, is very trustworthy. <laughs> the Union is a daily newspaper serving Grass Valley and Nevada County, California. The Union provides news coverage of the local and regional level. Sections include news, sports, opinion, entertainment, and more. It has a daily print circulation of over 14,000 copies. As a local newspaper, most readers live in Nevada County area. The Union also publishes an online edition. 65 people work for the newspaper, allegedly. The Union began publication as the Grass Valley Daily Morning Union on October 28, 1864. That's an important date. Jim Townsend and Henry Mayer Blumenthal founded the paper to support the Union cause and the re-election of Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Although the paper was founded for the purpose of supporting Lincoln's candidacy, Townsend continued supporting Lincoln. The day before the election, a group of men led by John Roland Ridge went to the offices of the newspaper and assaulted Blumenthal. One report states that Ridge committed the assault. In the 21st century, the newspaper identifies Blumenthal as the founder of the newspaper. Every issue in later years has carried the motto, founded in 1864 to preserve the Union, one and inseparable. In 1893, the Union became the Associated Press Wire Service first affiliate in the West. The Union incorporated in 1906. From 1864 to March 1945, it was a morning paper. It ran as an afternoon paper until July 1999, when it resumed morning delivery. Over the Union's history, 12 men and one woman have served as publisher. In 1906, the Union moved down the street from its original location to The Union, a building at 151 Mill Street, Grass Valley. Both historical buildings still stand in downtown Grass Valley. In 1978, the paper moved from downtown to its current location at 464 Sutton Way, Grass Valley. Thomas Ingram started working for the paper in the 1890s as an apprentice in the printing department and worked his way up to managing editor. The In Ingram family purchased the newspaper in 1946. Swift Communications acquired the paper in 1968, late in 2021. Ogden Newspapers acquired Swift, Swift Communications. In June 2022, Ogden sold the newspaper to Gold Hill, California Media. Then, of course, we have the Constitutional Union Party. The Constitutional Union Party was a United States third party active during the 1860 elections. It consisted of conservative former Whigs, largely from the southern United States, who wanted to avoid secession over the slavery issue and refused to join either the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. The Constitutional... That instantly is something that tells you that they're screwing around with things because there was no Republican or Democrat Party separation. There was the Republican Democrat Party or Democratic Republican Party. And then there's another one, allegedly, and with their own uh, fraudulent histories. So... They're even trying to change that. Anyway, the Constitutional Union Party campaigned on a simple platform to recognize no political principle other than the Constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. Now, as always, they leave these things intentionally vague so that people think they're saying one thing, but they're actually saying something else. See, they did not ref reference the you constitution of the united states of america they instead reference the constitution of the country which country right and then the union of the states see we might think that's the union of the states of of the Amer of the americas first of all here union is capitalized the states is under uh is not capitalized country also is lowercase c that tells me that they're talking about the union not the Union of the United States of America, but rather the the Union Union, the one the the one union, basically. The one and inseparable, in their own words. And the enforcement of the laws is of course are those international laws of the Union or universal laws or whatever ridiculous words they want to use. Anyway, they're obviously all in violation of the true constitution, the supreme law of the land. 
Anyway, the Whig Party had collapsed in the 1850s due to a series of sectional crises over slavery. There we go with that buzzword. Though some former Whigs joined the Democratic Party or the new anti-slavery Republican Party, others joined the nativist American Party. The American Party entered a period of rapid decline following the 1856 elections, and in the lead up to the 1860 elections, John J. Crittenden and other former Whigs founded the Constitutional Union Party. The 1860 Constitutional Union Convention, sounds like a UN convention, doesn't it? Got a couple letters off there. Met in May 1860, nominating John Bell of Tennessee for president and Edward Everett of Massachusetts for vice president. Party leaders hoped to force a contingent election in the House of Representatives by denying any one candidate a majority in the Electoral College. And their color was orange. Then we also have the Union League of Philadelphia. The Union League of Philadelphia is a private club founded in 1862 by the old Philadelphians as a patriotic society to port, support the policies of Abraham Lincoln. As of 2022, the club has over 4,000 members. Its main building was built in 1865 and added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. Union League clubs, which are legally separate but share similar histories and maintain reciprocal links with one another, are also located in Manhattan, Chicago, Brooklyn, and New Haven, Connecticut. Now, of course, as far as the Connecticut goes, I just did a video talking about the Connecticut Code and their military aid compacts that they share with all the other states to be wielded against we the people. And you can find that in the video that was uploaded just before this one. Now, you might ask yourself, how do they collect all of the money and funds that they need to establish this great union through smaller unions. Well, this section talking about union membership and fees gives us an idea. It states, First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievance. The First Amendment comes into play when the government or a public employer requires employees to join or financially support a union as a condition of employment. That, by the way, is false. But we haven't really had anyone who's been enforcing the true Constitution. We've been having people that have been enfor enforcing corporate constitutions of various entities. Anyway... Requiring employees to subsidize a union, even when the membership is not required, compels employees to fund the union's speech, implicating both speech and expressive association. So, essentially, robbery, right? They're robbing, robbing people. They're forcing them to pay regardless of whether or not they're a member. And, of course, they do it as a condition of employment. Anyway, for over 40 years, the court's decisions allowed such government-compelled union fees. To some extent. In 1977, in Abode v. Detroit Board of Education, the court ruled that public sector employees could require their employees to pay agency fees to their union representatives for the purposes of collective bargaining, contract administration, and grievance procedures. Now, I like how they word this thing as the people are their, their union representatives regardless of whether or not they're actually a member in the union. That's a little thing that I like to slip in there. That's claiming people without uh, reciprocal agreement, essentially. It's, um, it's the same thing as impressment, basically. Anyway, compulsory union fees, also called agency fees, could not, however, be used for political purposes. The court reasoned that the First Amendment bars a state from compelling an individual to contribute to the support of an ideological cause he may oppose as a condition of public employment. And here we get our first example of what our modern courts do, which is not actually uphold the U.S. Constitution, quote, Supreme Law of the Land. Instead, it's to arbitrate and explain constitutions in general of which they incorporate the U.S. Constitution as just any among a number of constitutions that are thrown about throughout the world and history. 
It's just one of the many, but according to them anyway. And they are not the court that was specified in the U.S. Constitution. They are simply a constitutional court being that they arbitrate affairs of constitutions, plural. Anyway, abodes allowance of fees for activities germane to collective bargaining, though criticized at times by members of the court, held sway until 2018, when the Supreme Court overruled this aspect of the decision in Janus v. American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Council 31. The Janus Court held that compulsory agent fees unduly burdened the speech and association of public and sector employees who did not want to join or financially support their workplace union. Notice that last part there. Do not want to join or financially support. So it's not actually their workplace union. In fact, the way that this is worded is it's claiming people as a subject of an entity to which that person did not voluntarily allow themselves to become subject of. Now, if you're asking yourself, who exactly is populating all of these unions that seem to be numerous and everywhere? Well, the answer is actually not as surprising as you might think. In other ways, it is. Also, under Title 43, the U.S. Code, Public Lands, it states the term person includes, in addition to a natural person, an association, a state, uh, caps S, a political subdivision of a state, capitalized S, or a private, lowercase p, public, lowercase p, or municipal corporation, lowercase m and c. So what that tells you is that you could have one person who can expand themselves into a hundred or a thousand. It all just depends on how many documents they can write. That one person can form 10 different committees, 10 different subcommittees, a hundred different unions, and you could have one person that controls a boatload of things. Obviously, that's a little bit exaggerative, but that's essentially the idea. That is what they're doing here. That's the trick. This is dated May 22nd, 1953. However, the U.S. Code is extremely convoluted and contradictory. And so we find out that these things are even laid out in a different way in a part of the code under the same title, even, Title 43. But this one was dated February 25th, 1885, which tells you that this idea of the juridic entity making a person separate from just natural is relatively new, at least, well, relatively known. Anyway, enclosure of or assertion of right to public lands without title. All enclosures of any public lands in any state, capital S, or territory, capital T, of the United States heretofore or to be hereafter made, erected, or constructed by any person, party, association, or corporation to any of which land included within the enclosure, the person, party, association, or corporation making or controlling the enclosure had no claim or color of title made or acquired in good faith or an asserted right thereto by or under claim made in good faith with a view to entry thereof at the proper land office under the general laws of the United States at the time any such enclosure was or shall be made are declared to be unlawful. And the maintenance, erection, construction, or control of any such enclosure is forbidden and prohibited. And the assertion of a right to the inclusive, exclusive use and occupancy of any part of the public lands of the United States in any state or any of the territories of the United States without claim, color of title, or asserted right, as above specified as to enclosure, is likewise declared unlawful and prohibited. Now, this is obviously written from an older time, uh, previous time because of the lack of periods. That's something you notice with older writing is that they like to use a lot of commas and semicolons. They don't so much like the periods. Nowadays, you're trained that it is wrong to use a bunch of periods or to, to use a bunch of 
commas and semicolons. It's not actually wrong, it's just, as they would say, an outmoded form of writing, but it is not grammatically incorrect. They just teach it as such and they punish you for your alleged lack of grammatical control, which is incorrect because obviously this person is very capable grammatically, but they don't use periods. In fact, there's pretty much only one period in this entire paragraph, which is at the end. Anyway, that's a sort of off the topic. Here, it is making a distinction between person, party, association, or corporation, whereas in another part of this title, even, it stated that a person shall be considered as a party, association, or corporation. So that's an inconsistency in their so-called law. And then, of course, this is the same document that makes reference to a predecessor sovereign. Now, remember, the United States Constitution was specifically made about this question of sovereignty, and it was won through arms. Through fraud, the same things that everything in the Constitution was stipulated and that people fought for were put back into place. And these people knew what they were doing when they did it. The United States Code is the law that was in place before the Constitution, and they re-put it back through fraud, not conquest. Anyway, at least not through legitimate conquest of arms. The terms grantees and leases include, without limiting the generality thereof, all political subdivisions, municipalities, public and private corporations, and other persons holding grants or leases from a state, capital S, or from its predecessor sovereign, if legally validated, to lands beneath navigable waters if such grants or leases were issued in accordance with the Constitution, lowercase c, statutes and decisions of the courts of the state, uppercase s, in which such lands are situated or of its predecessor sovereign, twice it said that word, provided, however, that nothing herein shall be construed as conferring upon said grantees or leases any greater rights or interests other than are described herein and in their respective grants from the state, uppercase S, or its predecessor sovereign. Three times it repeats that in this one paragraph, predecessor sovereign. Now here, if we go to Turkey, we get an idea of what the constitutional courts of today really are, and it confirms what I stated, which is that they are there to uh, administer or arbitrate between questions of constitutions in general. All constitutions, regardless of where they are, they take that upon themselves to, to arbitrate that and declare what a constitution means, regardless of the wording in that constitution, because their entire job is to make rulings based off of constitutions, plural. And one of the re things that you'll notice is that a lot of these entities, they all seem to share the same language, the same form of speech, at least patterns and otherwise, and they just, they all seem the same relatively speaking, that's because they are. They're made by the same types of people. These individuals, they move around continentally, and it is very obvious in the history of this union movement. They establish it one place first, and then they use that as a base to establish it somewhere else, so on and so forth. Anyway, International Conference on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Constitution of Uzbekistan on role and significance of the Constitution in building democratic state governed by rule of law. Again, they're very vague on which law that is. The role of constitutional courts in upholding the democratic state of law, the case of Turkey. 30th November 2017, Tashkent. Introduction. Democracy, rule of law, and human rights are the most fundamental principle of a state in today's world, lowercase s. Constitutions are in place to establish, that's a plural constitutions like I, I was saying before, establish a state mechanism based upon these, those principles and to ensure its sound functioning. Accordingly, the political model embracing those principles may be formulated as a democratic state of law based on human rights. Now, there's your coded language there, which is 
technically speaking, honest. They base the democratic state of law on human rights. And of course, they're the ones that declare what those rights are to humans in general. They get to stipulate what rights humans have, which is has a lot of sinister implications to it that we're finding out today. Humans are, to them are basically cattle. Humans in general, obviously not, not the people that are running this stuff, who are minions of the Druidic. Based on the judgments of the Turkish Constitutional Court, TCC, a democratic state of law may be defined as a state where the political power is restricted to protect fundamental rights and freedoms, and the rulers, as well as the governed, are bound by the rule of law. In the broadest sense, the role of constitutions in protecting democratic state of law are twofold. First, they provide the necessary legal framework for functioning of a sound democratic order through the exercise of fundamental rights in normal times. Second, they prescribe pre special procedures and allow greater restriction of fundamental rights when a substantial threat exists against the democratic order. That is called our way or else. If you do not do what we say, we will, quote, restrict your fundamental rights, and one of those fundamental rights is life. That is how their coded language works. Now, moving on to the United Kingdom, so-called, not very united today anyway, building a stronger union, lowercase u, House of Lords Constitution Committee, uppercase H, uppercase, uppercase L, uppercase H, <laughs> uppercase L, uppercase C, and uppercase C. In January 2022, the House of Lords Constitution Committee, they love these committees, published a report calling for the UK government to set out a clear vision for the future of UK's union. Although it welcomed the government's commitment to the union, it argued that a more modern style of governance was needed and that it was imperative that all executives and legislatives worked constructively and in partnership. The government has welcomed the report and said it would consider several of its recommendations. State of the Union. The committee stated that Constitution provided for significant autonomy of its constant constituent nations, complemented by the pooling of resources and sharing of risks to ensure greater resilience in its collective response to global security, industrial changes, and financial and health challenges. The committee said that the UK's collective response to the COVID-19 pandemic demonstrated the Union's strength However, the committee said that a modern style of governance was needed. It said improving shared governance required a greater degree of respect and partnership between the different layers of government. Now, that term shared governance is a buzzword that is equally shared with the University of Nebraska Kearney's Faculty Senate, of which I did work on in previous videos talking about them. Anyway, they love that word shared governance. Very interesting. Now, the British proceeded the United States in their unionizing, shall we call it, or their acquisition by the Union through strife and chaos, essentially creating a situation where the Union could come in and take over control. So first you had the U.S. Civil War, and then the period... Uh, pro, uh, after the U.S. Civil War was consolidation of power. And once they had consolidated the Union of the United States, they moved on to the next place, which was Britain. British Empire Union. The British Empire Union, BEU, was created in the United Kingdom during the First World War in 1916 after changing its name from the Anti-German Union, which had been founded in April 1915, from December 1922 to summer 1952, it published a regular journal. It stood for patriotism, social reform, socialism, industrial peace, promotion of the empire, and anti-socialism. How can you promote social reform and also be anti-socialist? That's an impossibility, because socialism has to do with social reform. Anyway, on 28th of July, 1916, the vice presidents of the BEU, Lord and Lady Bathurst, subscribed to a full-page advertisement in the Morning Post stating their objectives. To consolidate the British Empire and to develop trade and commerce within the empire and with their allies. Now, those, of course, are trade and commerce unions. 
again, has to do with the main union made up of many different unions. To alter our existing naturalization laws to render it impossible for aliens seeking naturalization to become British citizens so long as they remain subjects of other countries, this is to apply to existing cases. To pursue an educational propaganda throughout the country in furtherance of the policies that have been expounded by Mr. W. M. Hughes, Prime Minister of Australia, to establish branches in every constitu constituency and county, and to support candidates pledged to these policies in both the country and in the House of Commons to urge the importance of the measures proposed to assist the more vigorous prosecution of the war and to bring about its speedy and satisfactory termination and to controvert the false economic decline so aptly described as laissez-faire. In 1936, the Soviet newspaper Isvetsia attacked the BEU as the main opponent of socialism in Britain. Yeah, really an opponent of socialism, so... Pushing for a union. Yeah, okay. Which the BEU proudly quoted in its report, no other society was mentioned. In 1960, it was renamed the British Commonwealth Union and was taken over by a group of directors in 1975 who ceased its political activities. Unionism in the United Kingdom. Unionism in the United Kingdom, also referred to as UK Unionism or British Unionism, is a political stance favoring the continued unity of England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as one sovereign state. Notice, sovereign state are lowercase s's. The United Kingdoms of Britain and Northern Ireland, those who support the union, are referred, referred to as unionists. Though not all unionists are nationalists, UK or British unionism is associated with British nationalism, which asserts that the British are a nation, nation and promotes the cultural unity of the Bretons, which may include people of English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, Cornish, Jersey, Manx, and Guernsey descent. Now, of course, what this paragraph is doing is trying to embed and hide the people that support this grand union among, quote-unquote, nationalism. Anyway, since the late 20th century, differing views on the constitutional status of the countries within the UK have become a bigger issue in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and to a lesser extent in Wales. The pro-independent Scottish National Party first became the governing body of the Scottish Parliament in 2007, and it won an outright majority of seats at the 2011 Scottish Parliament election. This led to a referendum on Scottish independence in 2014, where voters were asked, should Scotland be an independent country? 44.7% of voters answered yes, and 553 answered no, with a record voter turnout of 84.5%. Yeah, that election was certainly legitimate. <laughs> At least in the sense that we're thinking, because that is definitely an election of juridic entities. Anyway, in 1542, the crowns of England and Ireland had been united through the creation of the Kingdom of Ireland under the Crown of Ireland Act 1542. Since the 12th century, the King of England had acted as a Lord of Ireland under papal overlordship. The Act of 1542 created the title of King of Ireland for King Henry VIII of England and his successors. I suppose those would be sovereign predecessors today. <laughs> Removing the role of the Pope as the ultimate overlord of Ireland. Crowns of England and Scotland were united in 1603 when the James VI, I believe sixth or fourth, of Scotland succeeded his cousin Elizabeth I in England. Kingdom of Great Britain was formed on 1st of May 1707 through the Acts of Union 1707. Two simultaneous acts passed by the parliaments of England and Scotland. These created a political union between the Kingdom of England consisting of England and Wales and the Kingdom of Scotland. This event was the result of the Treaty of Union that was agreed on 22 July 1706. The acts created a single parliament of Great Britain at Westminster, as well as a customs and monetary union. However, England and Scotland remained separate legal jurisdictions. And then, of course, they had another act of union in 1800. And then, in England, support for the union has traditionally been high. Naturally, vagary being used there because the support for the union being high definitely has to do with juridic entities. Those peace persons that can be associations, groups, organizations, and whatnot. While support for a separate English state has conversely been relatively low, 
However, the rise of English nationalism has seen a decrease in support for the United Kingdom, although English nationalism does not necessarily advocate English independence for the United Kingdom and blah, blah, blah. Now, the Imperial College of London has a constitution. No surprise. There's some interesting things in this document. So, we'll look at, briefly at it. The Imperial College Union, the Union, is a student's union within the meaning of the Education Act of 1994. The union is devoted to the educational interests and welfare of its members. The union will seek at all times to ensure that the diversity of its membership is recognized and that equal access is available to all members of whatever origin or orientation and pursue its aims and objectives independent of any political party or religious group. That would be very important when it comes to juridic entities, of course, because juridic entities have a particular origin and a particular orientation. They also cannot have sex, or what many people nowadays call gender, because they're made of paper and associations and whatnot. This constitution has been structured to give the Board of Trustees reasonable authority to manage the affairs of the union in a professional manner. The members enjoy the right, which must be exercised in accordance with charity law, to elect a proportion of the trustees and to dismiss any of the trustees. The Board of Trustees will give the utmost consideration to the views of members. Under the Education Act of 1994, Imperial College London has a statutory duty to ensure that the union operates in a fair and democratic manner and is held to proper account for its finances. The union therefore works with Imperial College London in ensuring that the affairs of the union are properly conducted and the educational welfare needs of the union's members are met. Definitions and Interpretations The meanings of any defined terms in this constitution are set out in Clause 119. The trustee board interprets this constitution its bylaws and any reserve matter policy rule act or omission made under it. If any dispute arises in relation to the interpretation of this constitution or any of the bylaws, when the trustee board is not meeting, an initial interpretation will be given by the president. There shall be a student's union in the name of Imperial College Union, and in this constitution it is called the Union. But it is not the only union that they're referring to in this document. That's the word game there. Objects. The union's objects are the advancement of education of students at Imperial College London for the public benefit by promoting the interests and welfare of students at Imperial College London during their course of study and representing, supporting, and advising students. Where a vacancy arises on the Board of Trustees with the result that Clause 6.33.3, wait, 6.3.3, applies to more than half of the trustees, the union may continue to pay remuneration to its officer trustees and any connected persons receiving remuneration in accordance with Clause 6.3.3, provided that the union uses all reasonable endeavors to fill the vacancy as soon as possible. Now, notice this part at the bottom. The, uh, the part in the middle is interesting, but not entirely applicable. Membership. Members. The members of the union shall be each and every student, uppercase S, who has not opted out by notifying Imperial College London and the union of his or her wish not to be a member. And here they go with this coercive policy that we see especially today where they try to include people in settlements based simply off the fact that they did not respond to a demand that if they didn't opt out then they wouldn't then they would be included in the settlement and then obviously sometimes you just don't even get any notice you're just included in things that you don't even know about because there is no really legitimate law right now we have things like this going on everywhere just like with the compuls government-backed compulsory union fees in the United States. Then we have a great union day, allegedly in Romania, on Friday, December the 1st, 2023. Now, moving on to international spheres. The Second International, 1889 to 1916, was an organization of socialist and labor parties formed on 14 July 1889 
at two simultaneous Paris meetings in which delegations from 20 countries participated, the Second International continued the work of the dissolved First International, though excluding the powerful anarcho syndicalist movement, while the International had initially declared its opposition to all warfare between European powers, most of the major European parties ultimately chose to support their respective states in World War I after splitting into pro-allied, pro-central powers and anti-militarist factions. The International ceased to function. After the war, the remaining factions of the International went on to found the Labour and Socialist International, the International Working Union of Socialist Parties, and the Communist International. Now, here's a couple things to note here. These are communists and Nazis all carrying out the same ends, even though they're apparently rivals. All of these groups, they all work together and they pretend to be rivals. But you also see a general movement based off of wars. First, you had the Civil War in the United States, which established our Union of the United States, part of the main union. Then after that, you had the great, so-called great wars in Europe. So the Unionists moved on to Europe and did all their work there. Now, once the United States and Europe had been established, then they moved on to Asia. That is the reference in the Maoist work talking about how these unions are established through conflict. They instigate the conflicts. They establish their control. No one's the wiser. Now we have the International Working Union of Socialist Parties, which it states, states the centrist Marxism, socialism. That doesn't mean anything. They're all unionist. Anyway, the International Working Union of Socialist Parties, IWUSP, also known as the Two and a Half International or the Vienna International, and there's the German, was a political international for the cooperation of socialist parties. Now, Something that should be noted is that the Nazis came out of the Belgian Socialist Workers' Party and the founder of the United Nations, or the first president, His Excellency apparently called, was in fact a Nazi, a quote, prominent political figure in the Belgian Socialist Workers' Party. Anyway, the IWUSP was founded on February 27, 1921, at a con conference in Vienna, Austria, by 10 parties, including the Independent Social Democratic Party of Germany, USPD, the French section of the Workers' International, SFIO, the Independent Labour Party, ILP, the Social Democratic Party of Switzerland, SS SPS, the Social Democratic Party of Austria, SPO, and the Federation of Romanian Socialist Parties, FPSR, created by splinter groups of the Socialist Party of Romania, Romania in April 1921 is joined by the Spanish Socialist Workers Party, the Maxi Maximalist faction of the Italian Socialist Party, PSI also joined. Now, note, all of these groups could in fact be staffed by the same group of people because they are they love to play this game where they make all of these different groups and committees and subcommittees and different unions to give the perception that there are more of them than there actually are. Now, the International Socialist Workers and Trade Union Congress, London, 1896. The International Socialist Workers and Trade Union Congress held in London from July 26 to August 1st, 1896 was the fourth Congress of the Second International. The Congress has been described as the most agitated, the most tumultuous, and the most chaotic of all the Congress of the Second International because of the many factional disputes between and within the national delegations. Now remember that first part that we read stating that these unions are established through conflict. Naturally, they try to embody that. Next, we have the Trade Union Congress. Trade Union Congress is a national trade union center, a federation of trade unions in England and Wales, again, smaller unions to make one big one, representing the majority of trade unions. There are 48 affiliated unions with a total of 5.5 million members. Frances O'Grady became general secretary in 2013 and presented her resignation in 2022 with Paul Nowak becoming the next general secretary in January 2023. Founded 1868 at Mechanics Institute, Manchester. 
The TUC's decision-making body is the annual Congress, which takes place in September. Between Congresses, decisions are made by the General Council, which meets every two months. An executive committee is elected by the Council from its members. Affiliated unions can send delegates to Congress with the number of delegates they can send proportionate to their size. Each year, Congress elects a president of the Trades Union Congress, who carries out the office of the Ranger of the Year and then presides over the following year's conference. Now we have the Labor and Socialist International. The Labor and Socialist International, LSI, and then the German makes SAI. Notice the first two letters, SA was an international organization of socialist and labor parties active between 1923 and 1940. Nazis. The group was established through a merger of the rival Vienna International and the Bern International and was the forerunner of the present-day present Socialist International. The LSI had a history of rivalry with the Communist International, Comintern, there's that pretend rivalry between Nazis and Communists, with, with which it competed over the leadership of the International Socialist and Labor Movement. However, unlike the common turn, the LSI maintained no direct control over the actions of its sections, being constituted as a federation of autonomous national parties. Now we have the constitution of the AFL-CIO, amended at the AFL-CIO 29th Constitutional Convention, June 12, 2015, 2022. Article 1. Name. This federation shall be known as the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. It is established pursuant to and as, re, and as a result of a merger agreement between the American Federation of Labor and the Congress of Industrial Organizations, probably controlled by the same people. It shall consist of such affiliates as shall conform to its constitution, the rules and regulations adopted thereunder, and of course those affiliates are probably also controlled by the same people. Anyway, objects and principles. The objects and principles of this federation are to aid workers in securing improved wages, hours, and working conditions, conditions with due regard for the autonomy, integrity, and jurisdiction of affiliated unions. To aid and assist affiliated unions in extending the benefits of mutual assistance and collective bargaining to workers and to promote the organization of the unorganized into unions of their own choosing for their mutual aid protection and advancement giving recognition to the principle that craft, industrial, and other forms of organization are appropriate and necessary to organize the unorganized into unions. Now, it's likely that the unorganized they're talking about are not necessarily human beings, but other associations, organizations, and entities that fall into that juridic person label. To affiliate national and international unions with this federation, like I just said, and to establish such unions to form organizing committees and directly affiliated local. So, basically the smaller unions to form a larger one. And now, if international isn't enough, if America is not enough, if Asia is not enough, and if Europe is not enough, then now we have the Universal Postal Union. Constitution of the Universal Postal Union with Final Protocol and Annexes. General Regulations of the Universal Postal Union with Final Protocol signed at Vienna on 10 July 1964. Official text French registered by Austria and Switzerland on 1st of December 1964. Constitution of the Universal Postal Union Preamble With a view to developing communications between peoples by the efficient operation of the postal services and to contribute it and to contributing to the attainment of the noble aims of an international collaboration in the cultural, social, and economic fields, the plenipotentiaries of the governments of the contracting countries have, subject to ratification, adopted this constitution. Section 1, Organic Provisions. Chapter 1, General Article 1, Scope and Objectives of the Union. The countries adopting this constitution comprise, under the title of the Universal Postal Union, a single postal territory for the reciprocal exchange of letter post items, freedom of transit is guaranteed throughout the entire territory of the Union. The aim of the Union is to secure the organization and improvement of the postal services and to promote in the sphere the development of international collaboration. The Union takes part as far as possible in postal technical assistance sought by its member countries. 
Members of the Union. Member countries of the Union are countries which have membership status at the date in which this Constitution comes into force. Countries admitted to membership in accordance with Article 11. Jurisdiction of the Union. The Union has within its jurisdiction the territories of member countries. So here they're obviously claiming that these quote-unquote member countries are not in fact sovereign. Anyway, post offices set up by member countries and territories not included in the Union. Territories which, without being members of the Union, are included in it because, from the postal point of view, they are dependent on member countries. Now, in reference to this Union and not just postage or communications or labor or any of that stuff, under Article 45, which is part of the treaty for the forming of the European Union, it states that the freedom of movement for the workers shall be secured within the Union. Notice, European Union, uppercase E, uppercase U. This is just the Union, uppercase U. What this is telling you that only workers of within the Union, the overall universal main Union that we all have to submit to or else, only their workers, lawyers, doctors, professors, people with specific unionist titles, only they are secured freedom of movement. You're not free to move in your own country. You're not free to move outside of your country. It is the reason why you can be born in a place, you can leave that place, and then when you return, you're treated like an immigrant. Or in fact, you could be leaving in your own country and you're still treated like an immigrant. As in, you are not, in fact, a citizen of any sovereign nation across the planet because the only citizenship that matters is citizenship in the Union, which is essentially a worker of the Union. Somebody who furthers the goals of that Union, essentially only their agents are allowed free movement. And then, naturally, the so highly trustworthy Google completely lies about this topic. When you put into the search about the supreme law of the land, it states that the Constitution of the United States of America is the supreme law of the United States. That is not what it says. The Constitution of the United States states it's the supreme law of the land, uppercase S, uppercase L. Not lowercase s, lowercase L. And it doesn't state that it is the supreme law of the United States. It does not state that. Period. So Google is lying about what the Constitution states, regardless of what the people that run Google's feelings are. Worse still, if you look up the Sixth Amendment, you will get this garbage. It states the right to a jury trial refers to the right provided by the Sixth and Seventh Amendments. The Sixth Amendment states that all criminal prosecutions, the accused criminal has the right to a trial by an impartial jury of the state and district in which the individual allegedly committed a crime. No, it does not say that. They are intentionally misquoting a document and bearing false witness and lying. This comes from Law Cornell. But it, it is Google's hit and they highlight their misquotation. All you have to do is go and look up the amendment to find out that that is a bold-faced lie, just like the other one that they stated about the supreme law of the United States. doesn't say that either. Now, if you have enjoyed this content, please like this video, share it, subscribe to my channels, check out all my other publications, and there are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App. Thank you.